Hey everybody, Danny Hogger here with an important channel announcement. The last three episodes of Inspiring Teachers have been so wonderful that we've decided to spin off the episode on an idea that was created by a cat. No, how would that be though for like an amazing twist of fate? So Tavis and I will be hosting Inspiring Teachers on its own original channel. You can go there now, the link's in the description. Please subscribe and like and support our mission of motivating teachers and acknowledging the success of wonderful education professionals. Please go and support Inspiring Teachers on its new channel, Inspiring Teachers here on YouTube. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere where you get your podcasts and support our new educational endeavor, motivating teachers to continue to motivate and inspire students. Well, that's about it. I'm Danny Hogger. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Uh, we love all the comments, the love, the support. Now I'm gonna introduce our brand new episode and the very last one you'll see here on Danny Hogger channel, and that's our interview with Michelle Ferre. Please enjoy that, but maybe before you do that, go subscribe and enjoy our new channel, and thank you for all the support. We'll see you on future editions of free weekly music here on Danny Hogger Music Channel. Thanks a lot. You know, I think so many of our students are often told, you can't be this, you can't do that. And I'm totally the type of person who loves to go, well, you know what, since you're saying that, I'm going to prove it to you that I can. And I think a lot more people kind of need that message to help inspire them. Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. Welcome to Inspiring Teachers. I'm Danny Hogger alongside Tavis Beam. And we've just been having such a great time bringing this show to everybody. Last week, we talked to Todd Weiner and he gave a lot of insight of a lifelong experience teaching math in high school and elementary school. And today, we continue that elementary trend with Michelle from Pocketful of Primary. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Oh, we're so excited. It's great that you take the time. We know you're on East Coast time too, and it's a Friday. So, you know, happy Friday. <laughs> Yeah, happy Friday. Do you think teachers are like one of the leading users of the term happy Friday? <laughs> Probably. Uh, Michelle, could you tell us a little bit on the show? We're trying to get into the why of teaching and, and what brings us to this field. And could you tell us kind of your journey into getting into education? A lot of people who follow you on YouTube at Pocket Full of Primary or Teachers Pay Teachers know you and know a lot about how you teach. But I'd love to know why and, and when did you come into the field? So I totally have that cliche teacher story where I am that person who always wanted to be a teacher. I distinctly remember sitting in my second grade class and being like, you know what? I want to do that. Like, I want to be that person and never really changed my mind. I mean, it was always just something that interests me. I was always into working with kids. I used to hold school on my front porch for all the neighborhood kids. And <laughs> I took it seriously, like printed out worksheets, gave them homework. And it's always just been something that I'm drawn to. And I think for a lot of people, either you can kind of be born like wanting to be a teacher or you can kind of find that path later in life. I definitely was born wanting to do it. The only thing that ever interested me besides teaching was like graphic design or marketing, something kind of in the business field. And ironically, when I graduated high school, I was awarded like the business student of the year award. I'm like, awesome, I'm going into education. So <laughs> I got into college and I actually graduated in three years. I was totally that overachiever and I just wanted to get into it. I was not about that college life and I just wanted to start teaching. So I graduated at the ripe age of 20 and I started teaching second grade in Salisbury, Maryland, so on the Eastern Shore. And I taught there for three years, and I recently made a transition to the Western Shore of Maryland. I'm now teaching fourth grade math and science in Crofton, and we are departmentalized. So like I said, I only teach two subjects, math and science, and I teach it to multiple levels of students. That's wow. pretty fantastic. Neat. There's a lot to unpack in there. I spent a lot of summers in Walsdorf, Maryland, so uh, I love that part of the, the region of the country. Uh, what did you know? Second grade, was that a goal for you? Yes. And ironically, when I was in second grade, not that I decided what age I wanted, but it was ironic that when I graduated, I had wanted second grade. I knew I didn't want younger than that because I'm not a huge fan of tying shoes and blowing doses, but I didn't really want older than that at that time because I thought that the attitudes were kind of going to be an issue and that intimidated yeah. me a little bit. So I knew I wanted second grade. Ironically, I got hired into second grade and I loved it until I came to fourth grade. And surprisingly now, like fourth grade is my jam. I love fourth grade. And what do you like so much about fourth grade? 
For me, they just have more developed personalities compared to second graders. I mean, with second graders, your conversations can only get so deep, whereas by fourth grade, they're a lot more conscious of the world around them, and they're just little humans, and they have their own personalities, and I feel like I can make a bigger impact on them, but they are so much more self-sufficient compared to second graders, right, yeah. which I love. I love independence, and I love just being able to have those real-world conversations. I definitely felt that too. I, I taught middle school and then went to fourth and fifth grade. And uh, originally I had done kindergarten as well in my teacher prep. So there's a big difference between those developmental stages. And it, it's nice to have the experience across the board, but I, I did enjoy the fourth and fifth grade as well. Yeah, I feel like it's a good age because they don't quite have the attitudes and they're not quite like the teenagers. They still like you for the most part, like they're still willing to give you hugs. But at the same time, if you tell them to go do something, you can actually trust that it's going to get done. Absolutely. It's helpful, especially when you need those moments to put together the next step, the next plan, the next moment. And I love conversations. I mean, that's why we're here. Right. Uh, but it's also <laughs> my background in radio broadcasting, 10 years with the Los Angeles Angels. And getting to the stories, getting to those connections, it's why I moved from middle school to high school this year, mm -hmm. hoping to take it that one step further, those deeper meanings. And I think like you, maybe you're hoping that some of the things you say, some of the conversations you have will stick with them for their lifetime, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. I When I think back to elementary school, obviously I have certain teachers that kind of stick out to me. And my hope is to be able to be that for my students, that they look back and maybe it's not because I help them grow academically, but maybe just I instilled certain values or morals in them that then they can carry on to the rest of their lives. That's right. And in between, uh, we'll do two quick segments. In between, I recorded a message today about how doing one more thing every day, even something like that, it's not even academic, I think can help people in your life. You'll probably find that true in your experiences through business and through the classes that you took in college as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and ultimately, it comes down all to those relationships. And mm -hmm. I think that that's ultimately, that's my favorite part of teaching is being able to form a relationship with those students and then carry that on later into their lives. Right. You spoke about how your previous teachers had inspired you. What is it that they brought to you that you're trying to bring to your students? What did you learn from your teachers that you're trying to pass on to your students? Okay, so personally, like one teacher comes to mind and it was my second grade teacher, ironically. He was just the king of engagement. Like I, up until that point, I mean, I don't remember a whole lot from like kindergarten, but I know in first grade, I didn't really enjoy school. I was very much on the struggle bus. I mean, looking back on it, I was definitely in some intervention programs and just did not realize it at the time. And I wasn't really enjoying school until I got to his class and he would wear hats. And I remember he had this entire wall filled with hats and he had puppets and he played the guitar and he would play it within lessons. And we had songs that we would sing. And I was just so into it and he was so passionate about what he did that it made me excited to learn. And that's what I hope to then instill in my students. And he put so much into me, not only in me wanting to be a teacher, but I learned guitar because of him when I was a teenager. Cause I remember watching him and I was like, this is really cool. I want to be able to do that. And so it's those little impacts that you don't realize that you then, you know, kind of discover later on. Michelle, that's awesome because the first moment that I felt at home at my new school in high school, I told them the story about how when I was in high school, I was playing guitar trying to get into one of the bands, but I didn't play the punk rock that everyone else was playing. Mine was too soft. Oasis and Green Day were just not hardcore enough. <laughs> so I was at the corner of the gym trying to impress people, some female, that were walking by, right? And what I found was that it meant so much to me to have that hobby that was mine and meaningful. So I told my students this story, and one of the kids came up to me after school, and he said, you know what, Mr. Hogger, I was about to quit guitar because people were making fun of me. Mm -hmm. He goes, but because of you, I'm not going to, and I think it's going to be worthwhile for me too. And my little heart, like, melted. And I'm like, this high schooler just told me that. You know, he waited until everyone left to tell me because he didn't want to tell me in front of everybody. <laughs> but still, I was like, okay, this is then where I'm supposed to be right now. That's pretty cool. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, it really is about those moments that we can share with the students where we really feel like we're connecting with them. As much as we're there to teach curriculum, I often feel like my, my job is more to connect with them, to have a laster impact on their life than a, a longer impact on their uh, life. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned that, you know, when you were in that situation, that teacher pulled you through that. 
mm-hmm. you know, connected with you and, and helped you through right. the struggle bus. I love that, by the way. That's great. <laughs> I would love to try to use that in high school and just see the eyes roll from the teenagers. <laughs> but I love that, too. I'll take the joke on me if it makes a couple more people laugh. Right. My question then is, your most watched video on YouTube at Pocket Full of Primary, which everyone should subscribe to right away after you watch this video and watch all of your content, is Thanks about... Thanks I appreciate it. Oh, you know, we do what we can. Again, background in broadcasting. So, <laughs> so my question is, uh, that most watched video is about the sh- uh, particular time in your career where the struggles were amounting and they were amassing. And you were considering, you know, how you were going to move forward. Could you tell our viewers a little bit more about that and how you rallied? All right. Yeah. So I know the exact video you're talking about. I'm pretty sure it's titled, I don't want to teach anymore or something along those lines. And, you know, one of the reasons I love YouTube and I love vlogging is the reflection aspect. And I had never started my channel to go into vlogging. I never thought my life was interesting enough for that. But once I started doing it and realizing I could look back on my entire week and start to make connections where I wasn't seeing them before was incredibly powerful. So I love now having those moments on camera, even though it's cringy to kind of look back on, but I'm able now to kind of understand why I was feeling that way. So it honestly goes back to my first two years of teaching, which that video is from my third year of teaching. My first two years of teaching, I was that stereotypical gung-ho overachiever teacher who went into the field knowing I'm going to rock this. I'm going to, I'm going to be the best teacher. I'm going to do all the things and quickly plummeted. And that just was not reality because teaching is hard and your first year is really, really hard. And I ultimately was not taking time for myself. I was so passionate about education and I still am, but I was giving so much to my students and to my coworkers and to the other people in my building that I was not doing anything for myself. And after doing that for two years time, I mentally started to really struggle because I wasn't doing anything for myself. And now that I've started taking time for myself and really making sure that I fill up my own cup before I try to fill up someone else's has drastically improved my outlook on teaching. I think ultimately those feelings that I was having was a result of just the constant effort that I was putting in and the constant exhaustion that I was feeling as a result. And once I started really taking time for myself, which seems counterproductive, right? Like, okay, I'm going to sit and watch Netflix on the weekend to be a better teacher. Doesn't make sense. But ultimately, if I'm rejuvenating and I'm relaxing, I'm going to be able to then give more to my students. And as a result, we'll be a better teacher. Absolutely. I think we all go through some level of learning that lesson and oftentimes the hard way where we burn out. And so is there any like activities that you would like to share with people that you think are rejuvenating? Like, like what do you do to rejuvenate yourself? Okay. So that is so like personal preference. So what I'm going to throw out there, feel free to throw it back. Like if you don't like it (laughs) personally, I am a huge workout enthusiast. I have been a runner since I was in high school. (laughs) Yeah. Yay. (laughs) And so Ironically, last year, I was actually training for the Boston Marathon, so that took up a lot of my time, and that was my way to relieve stress. Now, it's actually going to the gym and lifting weights. I love lifting weights, and I personally think more people should do it, especially females, because it is so empowering. So I go to the gym six out of seven days a week. That is like my me time. That is my time to relieve stress. That is my time to improve myself, and I just love that time. Like I put in the headphones. I kind of block everything else out, and for me, that's relaxing. I know a lot of teachers are like, oh, like I don't have time to go to the gym. And I'm like, no, but that's the best part of my day. You know, that's when I really get to unwind. Besides that, I am a huge lover of Netflix. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Like I can sit and bang out, you know, a season or two over a weekend. I also love reading. That's my favorite thing to do before I go to bed. I always open up a book. Sometimes it's like a PD kind of book for teaching. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? I want to read something not related to teaching at all. Like I want to read like a crime mystery or whatever. And besides that, um, working out Netflix, reading and podcasts. I love to listen to podcasts, usually in the morning on the way to work and then on the way to the gym and on the way home. I love to listen to podcasts. And again, it's a lot of like crime mystery kind of stuff. Right, right. Yeah, I have also been working out a lot, especially uh, weightlifting, too. I find a lot of value in that because you really see the growth over time and you really feel like you're improving yourself and getting the endorphins flowing. I think there's been a lot of research that supports exercise regular really helps the mental state. Yeah, absolutely. I I don't have any workout tips, (laughs) but I do see the balance. And what I love about that conversation is finding whatever it is for you, right? Right. Be finding what works best for you. 
I plugged you in my class today because I used you, and this might be embarrassing to admit, as an example of what a strong um, teacher and vlogger and podcaster and balanced creator of content can be. And you mentioned how important, I think in a way, it is to have strong female role models. And I think our teachers are often that in our lives. So whenever I get a chance in history, I pump up the women in history, especially those that are under celebrated because they're just not represented enough in our history books either. So for you, if you stepped into my room for the day, who are maybe a couple of women that you think are amazing to look up to as role models for high school girls today and for middle schoolers and for girls who are growing up and coming through the pipeline? And you know what? Don't answer that yet because we'll get it in the next segment. That'll be a tease. Look at that. <laughs> Broadcasting's coming out of me. Where are the angels? Let's play baseball. We'll be back in a minute. This is Inspiring Teachers with Michelle from Pocket Full of Primary, Tavis and myself. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Danny Hogger, and I'm here with a Mentor Minute. So this tip could change your life if you let it, and it has for me. Each day when you're tired, it's winding down. You want to play a game, watch a movie, get on social media. Before you do that, you've earned it. Do one more thing. If you do one more thing each day in a month, that's 30 more tasks that you accomplish and didn't push off to your future self, didn't push off to later. Take care of it now. Do one more thing. After a year, that's 300 tasks per year with some days off in between for excuses and things that come up. 300 more things you completed. In a decade, that's 3,000 more things that you you have completed compared to the person next to you. You'll feel better. You'll start good habits. You'll accomplish more. You'll feel more accomplished. And more importantly, you'll have done a lot more with your time. Just one more thing. Don't forget to subscribe to Inspiring Teachers, the podcast for more tips and mentor minutes. I'm Danny Hogger. And welcome back to Inspiring Teachers, Danny Hogger and Davis Beam and Michelle Ferre from Pocket Full of Teachers. I'll admit, I'll own it during the show. I had to ask for the pronunciation in the last name. It's okay. <laughs> it's better to ask than to get it wrong. Absolutely. I get Hogger mixed up all the time. But we were discussing going to break. Uh, who are maybe one or two inspiring women that you feel like if you were to step into my high school classroom for the day, you'd want to teach a lesson on or want my students to understand? So I'm going to go with Wilma Rudolph, who was a track athlete in the Olympics. And that's the whole like runner in me coming out that I'm, you know, biased towards runners. But for anyone who basically doesn't know her story, essentially, she was paralyzed as a kid. Um, she had gotten sick. She had braces on. Her. You know, I think so many of our students are often told you can't be this, you can't do that. And I'm totally the type of person who loves to go, well, you know what, since you're saying that I'm going to prove it to you that I can. And I think a lot more people kind of need that message to help inspire them. Irene that's beautiful. I love the three lines. Again, the guitar connection. That's what people told me in radio too. Like you're coming from Stockton, you're not going to do anything. I'm like, okay, let me make sure to mention <laughs> you when I'm in LA talking to 150,000 people. Like, I will do that and I'll remember that. Like, some people, it's an important lesson, probably important in school and in elementary too, right? If if someone's on your case, someone's giving you a hard time, don't fold, right? right. If the criticism is valid, maybe improve yourself. Like, always be willing to take an ear of criticism, but use that as personal fuel, not anger, yeah. maybe not to go and it becomes physically motivation. React. Yeah. turn it into motivation. Yeah, Which I'll go off of that for one quick second. So like I said, I had always wanted to be a teacher and my family knew that. And I used to get a lot of mixed messages. I mean, my family was always supportive, but I always kind of got that, well, but you're smart. You could be more than a teacher or you have to know you're not going to make a lot of money. And first of all, the whole line of you could be more than a teacher is just mind blowing to me because in my mind, like teaching creates all other professions. It's a pretty dang important job if you have asked me in my opinion. Um, but I totally use that as my fuel of watch me. Not only am I going to be a teacher, but I'm going to be a highly successful one. And I didn't realize that that meant like, okay, I'm going to create a YouTube channel, but that's just how it came to be. And I love now to go back to those people and be like, oh yeah, well, I have, you know, this many subscribers on my YouTube channel and I'm able to make additional income through that and through TPT. And I'm able to live comfortably despite the fact that I'm a teacher or really because of the fact that I'm a teacher. It's so yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful. And you said you've always wanted to be a teacher. And now that you are a teacher and have been a teacher for a number of years, how has your motivation changed to continue? Like, uh, like what continues to drive you to do this great work that we are doing? So the fact that I always wanted to be a teacher, I think it's just, I felt drawn to it and I knew that I was interested in kids. I knew I loved the organizational aspect of it because anyone who knows me knows organization is my jam. And I loved, you know, getting to decorate the classroom. But I don't think I 
found that deep why until more recently into my, you know, third, fourth, fifth year of teaching. Ultimately now my why is my students 100%. I love my students and I don't have kids of my own. So I truly consider them my kids. And I tell them that all the time. I love my students. I love to be able to be there for them. I love to be able to help them grow. I love to be able to help build their confidence and everything I do is for them. And those late nights when I'm up planning an extravagant lesson, it's for them. And I think it took me a few years to really realize that. And it wasn't until I started building those deep relationships with my students that I realized how important they were to me and how much inspiration and motivation they give me within my job, which isn't the easiest thing in the world. It's it's a tough job and it is very draining and exhausting, as I mentioned before, but ultimately they give me so much life and they make me so genuinely happy. And I don't think I'd be able to get that happiness from anywhere else. Right, that's, that's so cool. It, it really is wonderful because so often we can get lost and uh, we, we, we focus so much on the curriculum. We focus on what needs to get done and really what drives us, what fuels us is that relationship. Those connections that we make are, are so valuable. Definitely, absolutely. And I remember a moment too when I had thought during my undergrad about being a teacher and again, lines of comparison, I was steered away from it. You know, I was told to do something else and to to aim higher, which is so offensive in a way. Teachers are the only professionals who prepare every other professional in the world, right? right? There is, and it's such a noble cause too. It's mm -hmm. service. It's building a better future. It's making the world a better place. And I always think of, um, you know, the kinds of messages I can teach, you know, outside of the curriculum too. And I wonder for you, Michelle, is... If you had a second grader and they're leaving your classroom today at the end of the year, what's one or two things that you hope that they would have learned from you besides the reading and the writing and all of those important things? Yeah, I was going to say, even without you putting that caveat, it definitely would be something more of like who they are as a, as a person rather than academic. I would hope that leaving my class, my students know to be themselves and authentically 100% yourself and do not apologize to anyone for who you are. And I want them to make an impact in the world. So personally, one of the reasons I love teaching is because I can be 100% myself and I am weird and I'm goofy and I use different <laughs> accents and I stand on chairs and tables. And I love that I can be that in front of them because they are so encouraging and kids are not judgmental. I mean, a lot of adults unfortunately are, and that's something that's learned, but kids will just accept you for who you are and they will love you for that. So I want to instill that in my students that, hey, you can be whoever you are and you don't have to apologize to anyone for that. And people will love you for it. And it's needed in the world, right? We can't all be exactly the same. Like that difference is what really unites us together. And then I want my students to make an impact. So I actually have the word impact up on the wall in my classroom because that's something super important to me. Um, it's not just about building up yourself and developing that. It's how can you then use that to service other people? And for me, a lot of that obviously happens through my teaching, but I also love to just give back to people. I think that that is so important. And I am so incredibly grateful for the things that I have that I want to find ways to give back to people. And I want to instill that in my students. Mm -hmm. One thing this year that I do is every Friday, um, I I pay for the coffee behind me for the person, sorry, pay for the coffee for the person behind me. Mm -hmm. And it's such a little thing, but I love to then tell my students and I'm bringing in all the receipts and I hang them up on my wall to show my students, like it's a small thing, but it does add up over time. And those are all people that I've made happy in a, such a simple way. And I want my students to be able to take that and apply it to their own lives. Wow. That's very deep. Yeah, I think that uh, your students probably get a lot of uh, encouragement from that to go out and uh, kind of do the same types of acts themselves. I love that, too, in the sense that we're nearing a year's end. I know this will be an evergreen podcast. It'll live, but we just passed Giving Tuesday. Yeah. And so I know I always donate at the end of the year and I pick a couple of things. We've had the Northern California fires that have been going on. So I did that. And Charity Water is an organization that provides free water wells in developing countries. And so I donated a dollar for each of my high school students and I showed it to them. And I said, I'm not just showing you this to, to do it for the show of it, mm -hmm. for the support. So, you know, hey, this Mr. Hogger's not a bad guy. It's not that. Mm -hmm. It's to let you know that small gestures matter mm -hmm. and that the awareness matters. And that even showing you this is more than this dollar is ever worth, it is ever going to be worth. But you now know you're helping make someone else's life better. So they don't have to go and fetch water all day, they can go to school. They can be in a seat one day where you are and have a better chance at life like you do. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that I, since we're in this portion of the show, that I want to 
them to know is gratitude also, right? That no matter what challenges we face, and we all face them, no matter what obstacles we face, we all face them. What are you going to, how are you going to make your position matter, your impact, right, mm -hmm. matter? Where is it going to be? It could be anywhere. It could be by any passion, right? Yeah, and bringing awareness to that. The other day, it just started downpouring, and a whole bunch of my kids were caught outside in the rain. And when they all came in, I, I said, isn't it so wonderful that we get to be in here right now and warm and dry? And, you know, there was a lot of uh, just that, that moment of recognition that there may not be, you know, there, there are people out there who may not have that resource right now. And I'll put in a quick plug if that's okay. So my second, yeah, my second year of teaching, I did a donor streets project to get iPads for my class. I didn't have a lot of technology. It ended up getting fulfilled by a random person in another state. And I was just mind blown by that. And it changed not only like my ability to integrate technology, but it provided my students with so many opportunities. So after that happened, I knew that even though at that time, like I was still a new teacher, I was very broke. I knew that eventually I wanted to be able to give back to other teachers in the same way. So I started a hashtag. It's hashtag pocket full of positivity because that's one thing that's huge to me. And I think it's very needed on social media is a lot of positivity. So essentially, anytime you, someone uses the hashtag pocket full of positivity on social media, I donate a dollar to another teacher's donor choose project. So to date, I've donated over a thousand dollars. So I'm getting close to the amount that someone else had donated to me to get this technology. But ultimately, my goal is to give that amount and then continue to give beyond that to be able to help other teachers in their classroom. So anyone watching this, if you want to go on to Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook, and use the hashtag pocket full of positivity. So just share something great that's happened in your day, or something that you're choosing to see positive, put that hashtag on there. And then I in turn will donate a dollar to a teacher's donors choose project. Way That's to lead fantastic. the way. That yeah. is so cool. You know, we've been talking over this t-shirt idea where we would design teacher t-shirts and donate the proceeds to teachers. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working on plugging away on that too. Mm -hmm. So we know your time is valuable. We'll just ask you one more and we'll tell all of our viewers and listeners and on Danny Hogger's channel too and Hogger History to go check out Pocket Full of Primary on Teachers Pay Teachers and YouTube. It's well worth it. It's the best investment you can make as an elementary school teacher. <laughs> I think my wife watches it. Both of our wives are elementary school teachers. So we are in a pod. We are constantly <laughs> talking this stuff not just what we do on Friday nights. It's what we do every night. That is our life. And we're just like, we should start recording some of these conversations yes, that we're having. Exactly. Yeah. So we're grateful for you. And our last question today is just that teacher who's come into you and there's so many people who look to you for advice and who you give inspiration to. We love that. If uh, someone's asking you today, they're about to enter their classroom for the first time in fourth grade, what's your number one thing for them? What's something you wish you would have known day one? What would you say? Oh, okay. You limited to me to one. I was going to say, I have three. Take three. Um, yeah. You know okay. what? <laughs> YouTube. Go for it. <laughs> Number one, be willing to ask questions. I was so afraid my first year to admit that I didn't know it. You know, not that I didn't know anything, but there were things I didn't know and I was afraid to ask for help. So be willing to grow and ask questions and it's okay to admit that you don't know something. Number two, you can't do everything. I love the quote, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Do not try to overload yourself within your first few years trying to do all the things because it's not going to go well. Instead, pick one subject area or even one area like organization, whatever it is, to really devote yourself to that year in order to improve on it and then pick something new every year. And after you get several years experience, you will already be a lot better in a lot of different things. Finally, take time for yourself. I mentioned how I definitely got burnt out within my first few years of teaching and take time for yourself, even though you may feel guilty and it's difficult, you can't pour from an empty cup. And when you rejuvenate yourself and you fill your own cup, you can then be a better teacher for your students. That's some great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And there's so much more at Pocket Full of Primary on YouTube. <laughs> you can watch and enjoy. Michelle, we are so grateful. We broke apart the channel, split it off into its own thing. It's now void of me and it's us and we're going for it. And we're so grateful that you would join us and take this time. We hope you'll be with us again. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And I just, I love what you're doing because I think more teachers need these kinds of messages. So sure, come check out me, but also like if you were watching this, spread it to other teachers because they need to see it as well. That's right. Everyone needs that motivation to do a better job for their students so they can do a better job in their career. Yeah. Thanks so much. And uh, for that, that's us for it. Yeah, love it. <laughs> see, no, also stop right there, but that's us for it is pretty good. That's I mean, us that should it. be our hashtag. <laughs> so Danny Hogger and Davis Beam and Michelle Foray, thank you for joining us. We'll see you on the next edition of Inspiring Teachers.